presentación muy breve, lo he dicho al profesor José, porque lo importante es escucharle a él y, y, y darle paso a y darle la palabra enseguida. El profesor José es profesor eh, de, del Departamento de Ciencias Jurídicas de, de la Universidad de Quebec en Montreal. Es eh, también, y eso creo que es muy relevante destacarlo en la Facultad de Derecho, es también abogado en ejercicio o ha, o ha trabajado como, como abogado en ejercicio. Los temas de interés tienen que ver con el derecho público, con el derecho público internacional, constitucional, comparado también con, la, con los derechos fundamentales y todo lo que tiene que ver con el pluralismo cultural, religioso y el, cambio, el derecho y el cambio. En, en, eh, entre sus múltiples eh, publicaciones yo resaltaré alguna que tiene su currículum con, que eh, me ha parecido especialmente sugerente el, el título, por ejemplo tiene una monografía que es sobre la discriminación indirecta en el, en el campo del empleo, aspectos jurídicos, y había encontrado un libro que tiene una, una, un título también muy sugerente, Ciudadanía y Derechos Fundamentales, dice una ciudadanía limitada, fragmentada, ilusoria, entre interrogantes. Y eh, yo diría que, la, que, la, que el, el interés también del currículum de, del profesor José tiene, eh, tiene que ver con aspectos que, eh, que están relacionados con su compromiso en cuestiones también sociales o en cuestiones con la comunidad en la que vive, que es la comunidad que de Quesa. Y ahí eh, querría resaltar dos aspectos. Uno es su participación en la Comisión de Derechos de la Persona y de Derechos de la Juventud de Quebec. Y otro, pues algo de lo que hemos estado hoy hablando en la comida, que es su participación en, eh, eh, diríamos, como asesor jurídico, como consultor, en lo que fue el famoso informe Bouchard, eh, Taylor, Taylor Bouchard, que acabó en, en, el, en este documento construyendo un futuro, un tiempo de, de reconciliación. El, el, el profesor nos ha explicado que no tuvo que ver con la redacción, pero sí con, la, con los aspectos jurídicos o con la, el, el, los fundamentos de este informe, que es un documento muy importante para cualquiera que trabaje sobre aspectos que tengan que ver con el pluralismo eh, cultural, religioso y con las sociedades multiculturales. Yo no, no voy a decir nada más, le voy a, a ceder la palabra. Thank you very much for being here. And, uh, Thank you very much. I'm going to use this, so please tell me if it's too loud or if it's not loud enough. I have to know for your own benefit. So thank you for inviting me. I'm very uh, pleased to be here. Uh, I'm already thanking the interpreter who's doing the hard work this afternoon, trying to translate my English into your Spanish. I apologize for not being able to uh, speak Spanish. I can understand most of the Spanish I hear. I'm actually taking lessons in Spanish these days, but I'm not fluent enough to speak in Spanish before you. So please, uh, I, ap I apologize to you. And thank you for listening then to me in English. The subject of my conference is cultural rights. And my purpose is to present cultural rights in the broad framework of human rights as an unfinished journey. We haven't yet achieved a proper understanding and a proper recognition of cultural rights in the human rights world. This is my thesis this afternoon. I'm going to uh, deal with that subject in very general terms. I will try to give examples which are relevant. Uh, sometimes I will even give you examples that come from my own perspective as a Québécois as a Canadian. Uh, so those are only examples. I think you will be able to find similar examples in your own societies. Okay, so let's start by some historical background. Why are we talking about culture in 2015? It is important to talk about culture and cultural rights as human rights because uh, the history of the world is in fact the history of contacts between various cultures and civilizations. Spain is a 
convincing example of this with the many influences it has had since a long time ago. I don't have to convince you of this. Societies are not static. They are changing constantly. It's always been this way. It's probably even more this way now because of what we call globalization. So cross-cultural uh, cross exchanges are fundamental. However, modern nation building in the 19th century was based on the idea that one culture means one country. One country, one country means one culture. And this has led to conflicts, which have shown that perhaps we should go beyond this idea that one country means one country, one culture and only one culture. So this is the historical background. Nowadays, the situation today is uh, made more complicated, not necessarily worse, but certainly more complicated by the fact of migrations, which precisely shatter the idea that one nation means one culture only. Okay? So we have to face this new situation and try to deal with, with it. My hypothesis is that it is possible to do this through the concept of cultural human rights. So this is the theme of my presentation. Uh, I have distributed for those of you who uh, feel like reading it, a text in English by uh, Jacinta O'Hagan, who is an American scholar, who wrote uh, a long time ago, but her paper is still very relevant, an article on three different views of culture and how this relates to the international order. She uh, <coughs> presents three different views of culture. One of them sees cultures as being in conflict. It's the very well-known theme developed by Samuel Huntington, an American scholar, who basically argued that there are a very limited number of general cultures, the West, the East, for example, and that those cultures are have always been and will always be in conflict with each other, and they should be preserved as such individually, otherwise there will be too many conflicts. So cultures should remain distinct, but there, was all, there will always be a tension between them. It's a quite pessimistic view of culture. You have a more optimistic view, which was, what, which was uh, put forward by uh, another American, Francis Fukuyama, who is of Japanese origin, but he's an American. Okay. Uh, and this thesis is more optimistic. He's ba basically saying that cultures will tend to converge because of globalization. So we will gradually see the cultures of the world being more homogeneous. And his idea of an homogeneous culture is a culture based on the free market, on liberalism, on democracy, and so on. And there is a third view, uh, more uh, skeptical, neither optimistic nor pessimistic, just skeptical, put forward by another American of Palestinian origin, I think, Edward Said, who wrote a number of very interesting books. One of them is called Orientalism. Uh, and his thesis is that cultures are neither in conflict or in the process of converging. They are just coexisting. And the history of the world, in his view, is the history of that coexistence, how to manage that coexistence, knowing that there are power relationships between cultures. But his idea is also that cultures can dialogue, because they are dynamic, they are fluid, they are not, set, they are not settled forever. This is the view that I tend to prefer. And this is the one that I'm going to try to focus on during my presentation. I'm going to uh, talk briefly, don't worry, this won't be too long, briefly about the journey so far. What's the road that we have followed since, let's say, 1945, since the end of the Second World War, in terms of recognizing cultural rights as human rights. 
I'm going to uh, deal in that first part of my speech with the recognition of the general category called economic, social, and cultural rights. And then I'm going to talk more specifically about cultural rights in the second part. So, if you're familiar with the history of the uh, human rights movement in the United Nations, you might know already that the initial idea of the UN was to draft one legal treaty on human rights. That would include both civil and political rights, and economic, social, and cultural rights. Only one treaty for all the rights. This was the idea at the beginning. It didn't last long, because in the late 40s, early 50s, the Cold War began. And during the Cold War, countries didn't agree anymore on that idea. So in 1952, there was a separation of the project. They decided at the UN that there would be not one, but two treaties, one on civil and political rights, and the other one on economic, social, and cultural rights. And this is what happened, in fact. There were eventually two treaties. Why was that so? What were the reasons given for that decision to separate the initial idea? One of the reasons given was legal. You could not, apparently, use economic, social, and cultural rights in court. They were too political for that. So there was this reason for writing two different treaties, one for economic and social rights, non-justiciable non before courts, and another one for civil and political rights that you could use in courts. That was the legal argument, mostly used by the Western nations. There was an ideological reason, too, because the West didn't like the idea of economic, social, and cultural rights. And the socialist nations at the time didn't like the idea of civil and political rights. So ideological reasons and political reasons. Nobody, Western or Eastern, was interested in having the UN look at the way economic, social, and cultural rights are implemented in their own backyard. Nobody wanted that. So in the end, everybody agreed that it was necessary to separate the initial project. So that's why we have two different treaties. If you look at the second treaty, the one on economic, social, and cultural rights, what can we see in that treaty? We see a number of rights, OK? Culture is just one of them. All the others deal with economic or social rights. I'm going to talk later about culture, but now this is the general aspect. Oops. Okay, now, dealing with economic, social, and cultural rights. What's important to realize is that the, the level of commitment of states for those rights is quite limited. <coughs> Those rights do not have to be guaranteed immediately. In fact, states only have to act by all appropriate means to the maximum of their resources. So it's not an obligation to realize or guarantee rights. It's an obligation to make efforts in order to achieve economic, social, and cultural rights. It's quite limited. Now, later, after the adoption of the covenant, the UN organs which are responsible for that treaty have clarified what this means. And this is interesting because it shows the progress, it shows the journey that's being made towards the recognition of economic, social, and cultural rights. So the UN organs have clarified that this general commitment, in fact, means three things. It means that states have to respect those rights. That means they have to, they, they cannot act against those rights. They cannot, for example, uh, force someone to leave 
his home because he cannot pay the rent. That would be not respecting the right to house, respecting the rights. It also means that the states have to protect those rights against third parties, against others who might force that person out of his home, out of his home, to protect against third parties. And finally, it means that states have to implement the right to housing, the right to education, the right to, the right to health, by adopting measures, programs, financial incentives, tax measures, whatever. They have to act in order to facilitate the exercise of those rights. So we started with a very general and quite vague obligation. And in the end, with the passage of time, we have something that's more specific and we could say more demanding for states. I'm going to briefly now uh, go a bit further before discussing cultural rights as such. One example of the progress that's being made in the recognition of economic, social, and cultural rights is the idea that those rights have a minimum content, a kind of floor, a threshold that has absolutely to be respected, whatever the circumstances. This is something that came out, it's not written anywhere in the treaty. It's what has come out of the deliberations of the UN organs responsible for that treaty. The states have to show that they have tried every effort within their resources to achieve the right to housing or the right to health. And if they don't respect that minimum level, then you can assume that the state has not respected its obligations. What about the availability of resources? And what does it mean? Uh, again, the UN organs are saying to us, be careful. Don't think that states can invoke this as an excuse for not respecting economic, social, and cultural rights. That they have to use all their resources available, including their in internal, their own resources, but also resources that may come out of the international community. And the UN may even look at the way governments are using their resources. They might criticize the choices that are being made by governments. Vulnerable groups have to be protected, the poor, the indigenous, the minorities in general, but also women, handicapped, ch uh, handicapped people, children, and so on, are considered vulnerable by the UN and have to be taken into account when governments devise programs for economic, social, and cultural rights. And finally, before I start discussing cultural rights, we have some lessons to learn from comparative law. So forget about international law for a moment. Let's look at comparative law and remember the legal argument that cultural rights, economic rights, and social rights could not be used in court. Well, 50 years after, 60 years after, what do we see? Uh, we see, we can see about 2,000 decisions of national courts, which have been rendered over the years on economic, social, or cultural rights. And this shows that, in fact, those rights can be justifiable just as much as civil and political rights. So the reasons given in 1952 don't stand anymore. So we have made progress. That's my first point. We have made progress. We have journeyed towards the recognition of the general category of economic, social, and cultural rights. Now, what about cultural, cultural rights? The main subject of our presentation. Well, my purpose this afternoon is to show that there is still a lot of journey to be made in the recognition and understanding of cultural human rights. They are being forgotten and they have to be not only more recognized but also more fully understood. 
Okay, let me start by um, giving you a very general portrait of the way culture is dealt with in international law. I'm going to give a few examples of the law in my own country as well to illustrate what I'm saying. You can look at it in two ways. You can look at it first through the rights of states about culture. What can states do regarding culture? That's one way of looking at it. But most of you are interested in human rights. That's why you're here. So my second point will be dealing with culture as a human right, as an undeveloped or underdeveloped. Okay, the rights of states in international law. There are a number of international treaties concerning culture, which give rights to states, not to human beings, to states. The earliest one is the 1972 UNESCO Convention on World Cultural and Natural Heritage. This is the convention that uh, allows UNESCO to designate a building, a site, even a natural site, as an object worth of international protection. This is done through a request being made by a state which wants to promote one site or, one, one site or another so that it can be recognized by UNESCO as being part of world heritage. There are a number, about five or six hundred sites that have been recognized so far by the by UNESCO as being part of world heritage. So a few examples. Okay, this is the famous temple of Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Uh, this is uh, the uh, old district in Algiers, capital of Algeria. And in my own country, well, the Rocky Mountains are part of world natural heritage. These are just a few examples. Uh, I could have give, given another example, since I am in Valencia, I could have given you the example of the famous Donha, uh, uh, which is part of World Heritage, too, which I visited this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another convention, more recent, that one, called the Convention for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage. Now, I'm, ins I'm insisting on this because, going back to the previous one, uh, in that case, what is being protected is something tangible, something you can touch. A building, a monument, a mountain. The other convention has to do with something that is not tangible, something that is, well, part of culture. Culture or heritage is defined in that treaty as including non-tangible things, traditions, oral traditions, including language. Minority languages can be protected under that convention. The arts, theater, social practices, rituals, festive events, traditional craftsmanship, these are the human powers in Barcelona, for example, and so on. So, here, what's being protected is not things, it is the products of human imagination. <coughs> In other words, culture. However, this is not a human rights treaty. It's a treaty that allows states to apply for UNESCO recognition, which may lead eventually to some assistance from UNESCO, financial assistance, technical assistance. It's for states only, it's not for human beings. In the most recent treaty dealing with culture from the point of view of the rights of states, the UNESCO Convention on Protection and Promotion of Cultural Diversity of 2005, which entered into force in 2007, I think, uh, there are two great guiding principles. The first one is sovereignty of states. Now you have to understand that this treaty was adopted to protect cultures in the plural against the forces of globalization. Okay. Um, so that the treaty recognizes that states have 
the sovereign right to adopt measures and policies to protect and promote the diversity of cultural expressions within their territory. <coughs> so the idea was to give, for example, France the right to protect its cinema industry against the industry of American, of, of Hollywood, Mexico. Just an example. That's the idea behind that convention. And the other principle is that cultural diversity, and here I'm reaching really my subject, cultural, cultural diversity can be protected only if human rights are respected. Because the fundamental issue here is that sometimes cultural diversity may be in tension with the protection of individual rights. Okay. So in that treaty, they're trying to achieve a balance between the two by saying, yes, states have the right to protect their national cultures, but they must do so while protecting human rights. So there is a potential tension between the two. <coughs> Just one final word on that specific convention. It has its own limits, especially because uh, protecting cultures sometimes goes against the forces of trade and globalization. And what we see is that on one hand you have those treaties on cultural diversity, on the other hand you have another set of treaties on international trade. And international trade nowadays means free trade, free circulation of goods, capital, sometimes labor. So here again, how do you manage the poten potential conflict between international trade and protecting national countries? Well, in that convention, they try to give us ideas about how this should be managed, but it's not very successful. You will see why. First of all, the convention says that the two sets of treaties, okay, treaties on culture and treaties on trade, should support each other. But it doesn't say how. It sounds quite rhetorical. The convention also says that the two sets of treaties are complementary. They should complement each other. And the very generous idea is that when you interpret and apply the other treaties, well, the parties shall take into account this convention. It doesn't say that this convention will have priority over trade treaties. It just says that you have to take them into account. Not very helpful. It also talks about non-subordination. No set of treaty is superior to the other. They are on an equal basis. But what happens when you have a conflict between the two? No answer. Well, you might think the answer will be given by the court, right? Problem is that in that convention, there is no court. There is no complaint mechanism. On the other hand, in the trade treaties, there are very strict compact mechanisms, very efficient ones. And unfortunately for culture, the big trade treaties provide for organizations, the World Trade Organization, for example, WTO, can receive complaints from states regarding free trade. And they can condemn states that don't respect the principle of free trade. There's no such thing in the culture convention. <coughs> and the WTO apparently does not have the power to apply the culture convention. It only applies trade treaties. So regardless of the very generous principles here, when you look at recourses and mechanisms, you see that in fact trade treaties are superior to the, to the culture convention the rights of states in terms of culture are less important 
than the rights of states under the trade treaties. So the protection of culture is in fact is not very strong in international law, as far as states are concerned. Now, in terms of human rights, my main point, cultural human rights, not the rights of states about culture. Is it okay for time? Yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, this is a list, very partial, not complete at all, a list of uh, some treaties that recognize hum uh, cultural human rights. So the two covenants I mentioned at the beginning, and some UN conventions, one on racial discrimination, one on discrimination against women, one on the rights of the child, one on the rights of migrant workers. That one is not yet enforced because uh, countries that receive migrants have not ratified that convention. They have no interest in it. You can understand why. They don't want to recognize human rights of migrants, so they don't ratify it, so the convention is not enforced. Uh, the rights of persons with disabilities on the European level, the Charter of uh, Minority Languages. It's interesting to look at that uh, list, by the way, because initially we started with treaties that apply to everyone, and gradually we see uh, new treaties dealing with categories of people, women, racial minorities, handicapped, children, migrants. So we have a, an, appro an approach based on categories of people rather than on general treaties. If you look beyond treaties and you look at what's coming out of the United Nations, you see a growing interest there for cultural human rights. Look, for example, at the uh, report on human development in 2004 by the UN Development Program, the UNDP. Uh, it's a very important report because it stresses the importance of diversity, not just for culture, but for economic development, for social cohesion, and so on. Uh, it promotes more inclusive societies through policies that explicitly recognize cultural differences. And we are gradually moving here to what's my main point, recognizing cultural differences. I'll come to that later. And the report answers critiques of cultural diversity based on uh, the so-called capability <coughs> approach, which was put forward by Amartya Sen, an Indian economist was very much influenced the UNDP. So, cultural rights as human rights. Where do you find them? Of course you find them in the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. But you also find them in the other covenant on civil and political rights. And if you look at those two treaties together, it's possible to synthesize <coughs> cultural rights my own synthesis. I might be wrong, but I think it's convenient to see it this way. You can synthesize cultural rights as including three components, which I'm going to <coughs> at the moment. The first component is the freedom to create culture. The second component is the right of access to culture and participation in cultural life. And the final dimension, perhaps the most controversial one, is, is the right to have respect for your own dignity, cultural identity. Sorry. But if you look at freedom to create culture, it's obviously connected with freedom of expression. Okay. Artists have the right to create art. University professors have the right to teach. Filmmakers have the right to make films, and so on. The right to create culture. So it's a form of freedom of expression, but it's not just freedom of expression. Because sometimes the process of creation, for example, an artist begins a sculpture, doesn't like it, 
put that away. Okay? There is no cultural product at the end. He hasn't expressed anything. Nobody has seen what he has done. But he has exercised his freedom to create something. So it's a process. Creation is not a result, product, it's a process. This is what is protected under the freedom to create dimension of cultural rights. Not, not just freedom of expression. The right to access culture and to participate in culture is illustrated here as the right to visit a museum. Could be anything. I chose that one. So it's the right of people to have access to cultural institutions and cultural resources. Okay, since, it's, since this is considered as an economic, social, and cultural right, it's subject to progressive realization within resources. Remember that. So the rea realization of that right is progressive, but the idea that the right to access culture should be without discrimination is immediate and should be guaranteed from now on as soon as the state becomes part of that group. This is very important for vulnerable groups, children from poor families or from migrant families have a right to have access to culture on an equal non-discrimination basis and this is an immediate Finally, the third dimension, which I'm going to focus on from now on, is the right for to, the right to respect for one's cultural identity. It is an emerging right, and its meaning, its limits, are not quite clear yet, and need to be explored. Uh, here again, you see an evolution. <coughs> For example, take into consideration the 1948 Declaration on Human Rights. What does it say about respect for one's cultural identity? Nothing. The only thing that deals with culture is the idea that everyone has the right to participate in the cultural life of the community. It doesn't talk about specific cultures or minority cultures. It doesn't talk about minorities, ethnic, religious, linguistic. Everyone has the right to take part in the cultural life of the community. So as a Spanish <coughs> citizen, you have a right to take part in Spanish cultural life. That's what the declaration is saying, basically. However, 20 years later, the government on civil and political rights takes a different approach. In those states where ethnic, religious, or linguistic minorities exist, persons who belong to such minorities <coughs> will have the right in community with the other members of their group to enjoy their own culture, to profess their own religion, or to speak their own language. So, based on categories of people, not granted to everyone. And from my own country, another example, in my province of Quebec, the Human Rights Charter provides a similar rights for the uh, members of uh, ethnic minorities, only, <coughs> not religious, not linguistic, just ethnic minorities. So, some evolution here. Okay, uh, the right for respect, the right to respect for cultural identity is formalized in the civil and political government in Article 27. Uh, the UN is telling us that this right sometimes will force states to actively protect minority cultures. An example from Canada. You know that in Canada we have native nations, indigenous people. And the culture of those indigenous nations is threatened by 
let's call it modernity, <coughs> where culture is ours in danger. The UN has examined the situation of indigenous nations in Canada and told Canada, not only should you respect indigenous culture, but you should actually support it. For example, by aiding them, by supporting them financially to preserve their own culture. So positive obligations for the states to respect cultural identity of minorities. But this is only for members of ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities. Uh, the covenant says that this right has to be exercised in community with other members of the group. So Muslims, oh, oh, this is not a good example. Uh, Quebecois, uh, we, we are a minority in Canada. The Quebecois, like me, have a right to exercise their religious uh, culture in community with other Quebecois. Stick with, we stick with each other, and this way we preserve our culture. Okay, so if you look at the way states treat religious ethnic, linguistic minorities. There is a whole range of policies that you can think of. The less respectful for minorities is, of course, assimilation. This is what Canada has been doing towards indigenous nations throughout the 19th and most of the 20th century. Assimilation. The United States did the, did the same. Australia did the same. If you don't assimilate them, well, you can negate the, or deny the existence of their, of their culture. France does not recognize the existence of the Corsican nation. You deny that there is a Corsican minority in France. You can recognize that identity without taking it into account. OK, we recognize that we have such and such minority in our territory. <laughs> But that's all we do. We recognize it. We want support. Or you can take it into active consideration, helping minorities to preserve their culture. And this can take many forms. Active consideration. I'm going to give a few examples coming from my country very soon. Okay. So if you have that idea in mind, that states sometimes have to actively consider cultural minorities. What do you do with them? Uh, if you look at what's coming out of the United Nations, you find a very interesting concept, the concept of cultural adequacy of every human right. This means what? This means that the right to health, the right to education, the right to housing, the right to food has its own cultural dimension. Let's take the right to housing as an example. This is a photo coming from my country, Canada, taken in the, in the north of Canada, where a number of Indian nations live. As you know, Indians and Inuit people used to live in traditional housing, tents <coughs> or they were forced by the Canadian authorities in the 1950s and the 1960s to abandon their traditional housing to move into mobile homes like or quasi uh, temporary homes <coughs> that are completely out of touch with their culture, with their way of living. This has had a catastrophic impact on family life for them. It has led to family violence, alcoholism, and so on. So it was a culturally insensitive policy for the Canadian government to achieve the right to housing for those minorities. It did not respect the concept of cultural adequacy of the right to housing. So the same can be applied to the right to have the right to education as well. It's a very interesting concept, I think. The idea that every right, including 
civil, political, social, economic, as a cultural language. But then you might ask, what does culture mean? What am I talking about? What's culture? This is a sentence I took from an article by uh, Rodolfo Stavenhagen, he's a Mexican anthropologist. <coughs> and he writes a lot about culture and native nations. Okay, and he asked that question, when we ask for more museums, what do we want to see in museums? Do we want to see the clothes of kings and emperors? Or the cultural creativity of villagers, of minorities, of indigenous peoples, of immigrants? What's, what's culture? Is it high culture? arts, classical music, opera, or is it culture in the sociological or anthropological sense? So basically there are two ways of looking at it. You can take the humanistic approach and say that, well, culture is the arts, the sciences, philosophy, literature, and so on. Or you can take the anthropological approach, let's, let's call it this way, and consider that the way indigenous people live it's part of culture. This is what the UN has been saying to Canada regarding housing, regarding languages of indig indigenous nations. Uh, not just Canada, by the way. Sweden has been told the same thing, regardless the way it prevented uh, <coughs> Sami people from uh, hunting deer outside the normal season for hunting. You can even consider that religion is part of culture. This is a big issue. I won't discuss religion much today. But from a, an anthropological perspective, you can see, you can consider that religion is also a part of culture. This is what our Supreme Court in Canada is also thinking. Now, let me come to Canada as an example of how actively considering cultures can be implemented. The Constitution of Canada is interesting because it has a rule of interpretation, which says this, the Charter of Human Rights, our Bill of Rights, shall be interpreted in a manner consistent with the preservation and enhancement of the multicultural heritage of Canadians. As far as I know, it's the only constitution in the, in the world that says so. And what does multicultural interpretation mean? An example here. I don't have to tell you what this symbol means. Uh, the law in Canada makes it a crime to have what we call hate speech. You know what I mean. It's a crime. Someone one day was accused of that crime. And he says to the court, well, look, this law is against the Constitution because it violates my freedom of speech. I should be allowed to say whatever I think. And our Supreme Court said, no, we don't want to accept that argument because the rule of multicultural interpretation forces us to take into consideration the impact of hate speech and directs us towards criminalizing hate speech. So using multicultural interpretation leads you to accept that it is a crime <coughs> to have hate speech. This is an example of multicultural juris jurisprudence. Let me give you another example dealing with religion Islam. Uh, perhaps you cannot see very well, but this is a kirpan. The kirpan is a ceremonial dagger or knife worn by Sikh people. They have to wear it according to their religion at all times. <coughs> uh, there is a very famous case in Canada where a 13-year-old uh, boy wanted to wear his kirpan at school, in a public school. He was willing to wear it securely, uh, wrapped into a cloth, that would be closed and worn under his trousers so that it wouldn't fall, okay, and nobody could see. The school didn't want that. The school said, no, it's forbidden to wear a weapon from school, so 
forget about your kippah. And the boy went to court, or his parents went to court. And it went up to Canada's highest court, the Supreme Court. And what did the court say? Well, it involved multicultural interpretation. And not only did the court tell the child you can wear your kirpan as long as it's worn safely, but if you prohibit the kirpan, you would contradict the promotion of values such as multiculturalism, diversity, and an educational culture that respects the rights of others. So here you have another example of where multicultural interpretation can take you in terms of consideration for minorities. <coughs> we have another concept in Canada, which is which belongs to the same general idea. It's called accommodation of diversity. You might have heard the word reasonable accommodation. It's a word we use a lot in Canada. Accommodation comes from an ancient principle of philosophy. I'm looking at you, uh, Javier, because I know you have an interest in the philosophy of law. So you know that Aristotle, and challenge me if I'm wrong, but Aristotle told us that equality sometimes means you have to treat people differently. Because if you treat them different, uh, the same, while they are different, well, you won't be, re you won't be equal for them. So treat them differently sometimes is necessary for them to be treated well. Well, Canadian law has incorporated that principle and it calls it reasonable <coughs> accommodation of differences. So in practice, this means that our policemen, this is the famous Royal Canadian Mounted Police. This is not what they wear every day, by the way. They wear this for <laughs> national holidays, because it's not very convenient. But th this is the traditional uniform with a very uh, characteristic hat. But under the principle of reasonable accommodation, police officers are allowed to wear a turban if they are seen. It's not considered, uh, well, it's considered as a consequence of equality. Our, our conception of equality means sometimes you have to treat people differently. Okay, now, if you accept that law sometimes requires differential treatment and active consider consideration of minorities and culture. Does it mean that cultures are frozen, that they cannot change, and that they should not change? Are cultural identities <coughs> frozen? Is culture only for minorities? Must the right to uh, cultural life be necessarily exercised in common with only members of your group? And is there a place in that for a dialogue between cultures? In fact, what I've been telling you so far is that cultures exist objectively, must be preserved as such, and never enter into dialogue with each other. Contrary to Edward Said, as Ben said. Okay, this takes me to my final point. An intercultural citizenship. You can represent the idea this way. This is what I've been talking to you about so far. Cultures can coexist, but there's no real contact between them. Interculturality means something like this. Yes, they coexist, but they can also meet sometimes. And when they meet, there's a chemical reaction that occurs and that changes things that, that even can change cultures. That's the idea behind interculturality, <coughs> sometimes called interculturalism as a, as a policy. Okay, the UN and remember that I'm talking mostly about international law. The UN is more and more sensitive to this dynamic view of culture. This is a long uh, quote, I won't repeat it, but it comes from the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Committee. 
which accepts now that cultures do not exist as such forever and will never change. It accepts that culture is the creation and product of society, and therefore may change in the future. It is an interactive process. Is this legally recognized somewhere? Well, it is. It is uh, recognized, at least you find the word interculturalism, <coughs> or intercultural, in at least two national constitutions coming from South America, where indigenous nations exist. Ecuador and Bolivia have two very recent constitutions. The Bolivian one, for example, says that Bolivia is constituted as a an intercultural state. Okay. So the idea of interculturality is part of the law in certain parts of the world. It's quite revealing that this development occurs in countries which have indigenous nations because it becomes a necessity for them <coughs> to accept this process of dialogue between cultures. Okay, in my own country, uh, or at least my part of the country, Quebec. We also have interculturalism as a state policy. However, if you look at what interculturalism can mean, you can see that you can approach it in a different way. Uh, these are uh, quotes from two books published recently in Quebec about interculturalism. The first one comes from Gerard Bouchard, who's a historian and sociologist. <coughs> Both of them are very much in favor of interculturalism, but they don't agree on what it means. For so Gérard Bouchard, who is a Québécois like me, French-speaking Québécois, interculturalism means that the cultural majority of Québec, French-speaking Québécois, must dialogue with minorities. So a majority in dialogue with minorities. And the majority should be kept in mind, according to Bouchard. This will mean, he writes, that sometimes the rights of minorities will have to take second rank to the concerns of the majority, the cultural majority. Okay, so sometimes the rights of minorities are less important than the rights of the majority. He calls this an ad hoc preeminence of majority rights. On the other hand, you have another book on the same subject, which says, Mr. Bouchard, you are wrong. You cannot give priority to any given group, to any given group, because if you do this, you don't really have an, inter an intercultural vision. You cannot assume that one culture is more deserving of protection than the others. And this very cruel quote from this book, the purpose of interculturalism, Mr. Bouchard, is not nation building. It's just about managing dialogue between cultures. Don't care about majorities and minorities. It's possible to understand why Bouchard thinks this way. He's a member of a majority in a province which also happens to be a minority within a country. And I, to some extent, I share that view because I'm just like him, the Québécois. <coughs> I'm a majority member in my province, but I'm a minority in my country. So I understand why. But is this the only meaning that you can give to interculturalism? Obviously not. And perhaps this only applies to places like Quebec, or maybe other places, think of some regions in Spain, where the issues of national minorities exist. But I'll let you be the judge of this. Time is running out. Okay. Uh, I think this is my final one. How do you balance individual rights with group concerns if you think about the rights of minorities and the rights of culture? Uh, in the name of identity, you can do many things that are good and some things that are not so good. I was talking earlier about indigenous nations in Canada. Uh, <coughs> In the name of the rights of the indigenous nations in Canada, certain in, uh, 
Indian nations restrict their right to belong to their nations. If you are a uh, woman of Indian origin in Canada, and you belong to certain nations, and you marry a white man, you will lose your Indian status because you don't obey the rules of your Indian nation. And you will be expelled from your reserve. As in Canada, many Indians live on reserves, specific territories. And if you lose your status as, as an Indian, you are kicked out of your reserve. And your white husband has to follow you. So this is the kind of thing that may happen if you give priority to group rights over individual rights. So there are periods. And therefore, we need safeguards for this. And here it's important to remember that the very general principle in human rights treaties is that you cannot invoke a specific right to challenge or contradict another another human. So you have to keep a balance between the But there there will always be a tension between this. In the end, though, uh, perhaps a way out of this problem is to, oops, uh, one way out of this is to recognize that culture is a freedom, not a constraint. Okay. Uh, okay, what's the idea behind this? Well, it means that you have the right to claim not just one cultural identity, but maybe more than one. Many people in Quebec consider themselves as both Quebecois, Canadians, and citizens of the world. It's especially visible among young people. I'm sure many of you share the same outlook. You might consider yourself as Catalan or past Spanish, European, and cosmopolitan citizens. So you can have that freedom for yourself to claim more than one cultural identity, and maybe to change your choice over time when your personal circumstances change. Okay, this idea of culture as freedom is put forward by Amartya Sen. Remember the Indian economist I was referring to earlier. It's accepted by the UNDP in its 2004 report. It's a very strong feature in the Fibul Declaration on Cultural Rights. If you're interested in cultural rights, go Google free Fibul Declaration and you will see a very clear description of what cultural rights mean. And one of the principles of the Fribo Declaration is this idea that you can claim more than one cultural identity. Uh, but keep in mind, however, that some critics say that if you accept this idea of culture as an individual freedom, then you become a liberal. You become a globalized citizen, you accept that culture is a free market, just like the economy. In other words, it is the triumph of liberalism, and it goes against what certain authors call deep diversity, which should be respected over and above that individual freedom. So it's it's not an, a non-challenging view, but it's certainly becoming more and more institutional within the UN system. Okay, is it possible to conclude? No, it's not possible to conclude. I think we're still thinking, we're still debating, so this is just my way of conclusion. Is culture the, the blind spot of human rights? Have we thought about it enough, or should we think about it more? The relationship between law and culture. Many of you, I think, are law students here, so you are familiar with legal cultures, the civil law culture, the common law cultures, Islamic law, in the old days, socialist law. Legal cultures exist, and you're familiar with them. But very few people talk about the law of culture or the law of cultures. And this is something that should be um, considered more in the future. There should be some developments in legal thinking. It's also important, I think, to uh, forget the idea that cultural rights are for minorities only. It's for everyone. 
and it, it's not just a minority issue. And in the end, this is my final slide, I think, we should uh, explore some concepts. <clears throat> One of them is the, the idea that culture should be democratized. Okay, this means more people should have access to culture. And the idea of cultural democracy, which is something different. This would mean to me that all cultures are worth <coughs> respecting and recognizing. It's not exactly the same as democratizing culture. So thinking in those terms might be enlightening. Um, there is a right to be different. I was talking to you about accommodation of diversity in Canada. The law recognizes a right to be different. But there is no such thing yet as a law of difference. It's not been conceptualized very much. And perhaps we should think more about not just the individual recognition of difference, but the global recognition of differences. And finally, the interdependence of rights. I'm going to end on this because it's a basic principle that rights are indivisible, interdependent, and interconnected. The principle of inter interdependence was recognized about 20 years ago by the UN in the Vienna Declaration on Human Rights, the big meeting of states and NGOs that lasted for about two weeks in Vienna. And what came out of it was the Vienna Declaration. The Vienna Declaration states that all rights are important and are dependent on each other. So what we did in 1952, separating the rights, two governments, in fact was not the right idea. Because this way we <coughs> accepted for many, many years the idea that economic, social, cultural rights were different and did not deserve the same degree of protection. Okay? So in the Vienna Declaration, we take the opposite stance and finally, we recognize that all rights are interdependent. So I think, and this is my conclusion, um, the principle of interdependence means that we should respect the cultural dimension of everyone. Of course, we have to debate about where this can take us. Will it take us too far? Maybe sometimes. But at least recognizing the, uh, the interdependence between cultural rights and the other rights would be a first step. And I'm going to leave you on this idea. Thank you. is almost uh, a view of cultural ghettos, okay? Uh, the French call it communautarism, okay? Mm -hmm. So to them, multiculturalism in Canada means that cultures are separate. They are almost full folkloric <coughs> cultures, uh, and therefore this leads to communities closing themselves to the rest of society, okay? That's, that's how many Europeans see multiculturalism in Canada. If you come from Canada or Quebec 
uh, it's more complex than that. The idea of multiculturalism in Canada is, is actually part of the law. Okay, we have a law, uh, it's called the Multiculturalism Act. It's not the constitution I was talking about, it's something else. Um, and that law says the basic principles of multiculturalism are three or four. One of them is dialogue between cultures and participation within the broader society. Okay, so it's not the caricature that sometimes we tend to see abroad. Uh, I must say, to be perfectly honest, that many people in Canada think this is nonsense. They think that, in fact, multiculturalism means separate cultures. Okay? So it's a, it's a debate we're having, too, in Canada. But those researchers who have studied Canadian multiculturalism have, in fact, uh, concluded that multiculturalism and interculturalism, in fact, are converging. They basically mean the same thing. And there is no substantial difference between them because both of them emphasize contacts between culture. So uh, my answer would be European critics have an over-simplistic view of multiculturalism in Canada. Um, and my final remark would be that Many European critics of multiculturalism, um, well, uh, there, there have been critics coming from the UK and from Germany in particular, from important people in, in government. Um, uh, I think no, no European country has really implemented multiculturalist policies, with the possible exception of the UK. Um, so there is very little experience with multiculturalism in Europe. Uh, although, uh, although the, the, the Council of Europe, okay, the intergovernmental body, um, has promoted interculturalism very much, but there are national resistances <coughs> to the very idea of interculturalism. Do you think that the fact that the states exist, like national states, is like a talent for multiculturalism. Sorry, I was asking you, do you think that maybe that we conceive the word as a, a um, foreign by national states? Mm -hmm. It is a handicap or something that is a problem for this uh, cultural dimension that the multiculturalism and that we can live our culture like with dignity and uh, and proud. I think I think nation states can coexist with multiculturality um, as long as they accept the the, ver the very existence of diversity. This is maybe easier in federal states. Canada is one of them. Uh, the U.S. is one of them. I know Spain is not, but you are, you know, in some ways. <laughs> and I know, I know, I won't go into this. <laughs> but uh, at least there is some recognition of national diversity in Spain too. Uh, and I won't go into the details of it because I know it's a slippery slope. So I think there's no uh, incompatibility between nation states and, and cultural diversity. Uh, it's, it will be very interesting to see how um, those two South American countries interpret interculturality and implement it. The experience is too recent. It's still an experiment. Uh, one of the things you, you said at the end was um, uh, you asked if uh, cultural rights or cultural accommodation was only for minorities, and and then you said that you answered that no, that's for for everyone. But I I personally tend to think that it's actually my majorities don't necessarily need that accommodation because their culture is um, already institutionalized. So so I kind of take a different view on on that point. Uh, what, what, how? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for pointing this out. What I was meaning, in fact, is that. I was not thinking in terms of majority-minority relationships. I was thinking of access of individuals to culture, of access of everyone. You know, I was limiting myself to 
the axis dimension. Okay, I'm going to try to understand. Me ha parecido que el enfoque que, que, que ha presentado me parece muy interesante. Es decir, tratar de, de ver en cada uno de los derechos cuál es su dimensión cultural. Es decir, eh, pues utilizando el esquema para determinar el contenido esencial de los derechos sociales, tratar de ver en cada derecho la dimensión cultural del mismo. Creo que eh, es muy buena idea en el sentido también de... Eh, sacarle mucho partido a la teoría de la interrelación entre los derechos. Entonces, esto significaría hacer un análisis muy ajustado realmente de cuál es la interacción de unos derechos con otros, entonces ahí habría que, que profundizar más, porque hasta ahora tenemos como análisis un poco más superficiales, ¿no? de las conexiones, tendríamos que profundizar en el análisis entre la conexión de los derechos pero en, al final este enfoque que digo que comparto eh, en qué mejora la perspectiva de las políticas interculturales es decir es una perspectiva muy distinta a tratar de enfocar el problema desde el punto de vista de las políticas interculturales que se pueden hacer o va a mejorar o sea puede mejorar este, este Unfortunately, okay. the only part I did not understand was the last part. <laughs> Sorry. No, quiero decir que eh, si nos planteamos eh, hacer políticas inter con objeto de lograr la interculturalidad en sentido más positivo, ¿no? Digamos, políticas activas de interculturalidad no es algo muy distinto de tratar de identificar en cada derecho la dimensión cultural que tiene. O sea, veo que hay como que hay una conexión y no sería un enfoque muy distinto sino complementario. Okay, okay. ¿no? I think I get it. The sense. Um, uh, the, 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 the idea of cultural adequacy uh, goes beyond individual accommodation. Of course, it, it has a collective uh, policy dimension. Uh, It does not mean intercultural dialogue, no. Uh, at least as I see it, it, it it's two different things. Uh, the idea of cultural adequacy is quite established, or at least is being established now. The idea of dialogue is more emerging. But to me, there are two different ideas. The connection is not, there, there's no logical or causal relation between them, if I got your question. No, 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 no. <laughs> If you are interested in the Canadian aspects, uh, I'm going to talk tomorrow evening about uh, the more Canadian aspects of our debate. Una pregunta es muy corta. ¿Por qué Canadá votó en contra de la Declaración de Derechos de los Pueblos Indígenas? Ah, okay. Uh, Well, you know that we have about 600 so-called Indian bands in Canada. That means Indian lands being occupied and controlled by native people. They represent about 3% of the population. But they were there much before the rest of people came. Okay? Um, the Constitution recognized their ancestral rights. But Canada as a government, and the same goes for Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. Uh, Canada does not want to recognize even the idea that they have a right to secede from Canada. Canada is quite ready to accept um, the idea that they can self-determinate themselves. Okay? But this means, in the Canadian government's view, they can control their own affairs within Canada. Um, This is why Canada decided first to vote against 
the UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights in the name of you know, that idea. No? Canada, will, Canada will not be touched. Its limits will remain the same. Uh, that's the reason why. However, perhaps what you could not notice because it didn't make head news is that two or three years later, Canada eventually accepted the declaration. Because I think it felt that the reaction abroad was so bad that it gave Canada a bad reputation. So now Canada officially accepts the whole of the declaration, but the UN is saying, don't worry Canada, don't worry US, don't worry Australia. It doesn't mean a right to secede anyway, just for internal affairs of the indigenous nations. Thank you. Uh, just a quick one. Uh, you you were talking about uh, dialogue, multicultural dialogue, and uh, we've seen last week or two weeks ago uh, these guys from Islamic State, mm. you know, what they did to the sculptors. Uh, I think we all are in favor of multicultural dialogue. My question is, is there a limit? Mm. Is, there, is there a situation you might say, look, enough is enough, uh, because this yeah. can be accepted, yeah. or, or you might say, look, you know, we need to understand where you come from, because also you were talking about the right to education, mm -hmm. and we know that there's some cultures, even maybe older than the, the Western culture, that they don't consider in the culture that women should have access to education. Yeah. So should we respect that because we want the multicultural dialogue, mm -hmm. or, or where is the limit? Yeah. Uh, there was one slide uh, devoted to that issue, but I didn't emphasize very much one one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, articles from the UN <coughs> general comment on the right to cultural life uh, is that uh, you cannot use cultural rights in order to offend or violate the rights of women. It's very specific in that general comment from the UN. I could send you the reference. Um, but it's quite clear that you sh you cannot in the name of cross-cultural dialogue, uh, accept things that would be uh, unacceptable. You know, female genital mutilation will not be acceptable anywhere, even if you think about cross-cultural dialogue. It, it goes beyond the scope of what's acceptable. So I think, yes, there are limits. I think <coughs> quite obvious. Yes, that's my lawyer's uh, view of it, okay? Uh, rights clashing with another right, okay? But now the, the, the discourse that you hear more and more is that when a right clashes with values, then the right should be limited. Uh, in Quebec, you hear this. Uh, one politician a few weeks ago said that it should be illegal to... Uh, say that women should not have the same rights as men. Okay, just saying that should be made illegal. So what you have here is a conflict between a principle or a value and a right in the free speech. And as a lawyer, my reflex is to say that if you want to restrict a right, use another right. Okay. Uh, so you would have to show that what this guy is saying will affect a woman's right, not just the idea of equality. I know this is controversial. I know that maybe I'm wrong, but <coughs> this is how I would approach. But I'm a lawyer, so I tend to think in terms of rights against rights. Not, I'm not a philosopher or an ethician who, who might reason more in terms of values, principles, and ideas. There could be. Um, uh, let me give you another example of this. Um, it, it comes from, uh, from Quebec again. Uh, someone uh, wanted a driver's license. Okay? You have to pass a test in a car. He went to the government agency and said, I want to pass my test, but I am an Orthodox Jew. And I understand my religion as saying that I cannot be in a separate room with a woman. And being in a car with a woman would be like being in a room with a woman. 
Therefore, I'm asking you, government, to make me pass my examination with a man. Okay. That case went to the Human Rights Commission, the government agency responsible for human rights. And the commission said that the, the women who worked in that government office were, didn't even know about that. Okay, they continued doing their job, and the client was satisfied. They gave him a, a man as an examiner, and the women didn't even hear about that. So in the commission's mind, there was no effect on, the, on any woman's right. Okay? Yes, there was an offense to the value of equality, but there was no concrete impact on any woman. <coughs> That's a lawyer's way of thinking. And the reaction to that opinion by the Commission was very negative in Quebec society. And what does it show? I don't know what it shows, but to me it, it, it illustrates that legal thinking has its own uh, logic, which sometimes is not the common person's logic. It's not, it's not, <laughs> not very helpful. <laughs> but, <laughs> Thank you. I, I wanted to ask you, I, I can imagine a special topic can occur in relation with criminal court, for example, similar to cultural society. There are some groups that have a special rules in, in the sense like criminal rules. Or, so uh, how can we admit in, in certain areas uh, cultural code, penal codes that include uh, those stones uh, to that? for example, or this that that could be absolutely contrary to human rights. Mm -hmm. It's not possible to admit, so I, I can find here a, a limit, a new limit, no? sure. not only in, in a conflict between rights, but in, in the basic conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, polygamy would be another example, maybe. Polygamy. Um, um, well, uh, in Canada, there is a case now before the Supreme Court about polygamy. It's a crime, okay? Polygamy is a crime in Canada. And someone is challenging the, the law that criminal, criminalizes polygamy uh, in the name of uh, religious freedom. It's in the Supreme Court of Canada now. So I expect the decision to confirm the validity of the law uh, based not on the principle of uh, gender equality, but on um, social, sociological, anthropological evidence of the impact of polygamy on women. This is what I was, in fact, what I was thinking when I was trying to answer your question. Uh, I think that the evidence in that case will show that polygamy impacts on women's rights in very concrete dimensions. But to do this, you need sociological evidence or anthropological evidence, or historical evidence, whatever. You need to demonstrate something. I think it's can be, it can be done without resorting to sometimes very abstract principles. Uh, the other example you mentioned was uh, stoning, right? Yeah. Here again, it's very, I think it's quite easy to, to convince a court that stoning will have an impact on a woman's physical integrity. experience with multi-interculturalism, with reasonable accommodation, the experience has been reasonably successful. The, the, the question was uh, posed uh, a few years ago about accommodation in Quebec. The government set up an investigation commission 
on reasonable accommodation. And the Commission's conclusion was that reasonable accommodation works. And if there was a crisis in society about accommodation, it was a crisis that came out of the media, which exaggerated the issues. So apparently, it works reasonably well. I'm not so optimistic about the future, though, because of the political climate, which uh, is somewhat the same in all over Western countries. The uh, issue of fundamentalism and terrorism is also very present in Canada. We've had a few uh, terrorism acts uh, recently in, uh, in our capital and in my own province, too. And this is uh, leading to uh, a kind of confusion between religious orthodoxy, fundamentalism, and terrorism. And this is not a good planet for either multiculturalism or interculturalism. It's a, it's a political and social issue.